Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your faithfulness and your love for us. Thank you for the consideration you have that brought that you, that you chose to give us your word and not leave us in the dark. And that you chose to reveal yourself to us in your word, in history, by your life, and ultimately in our hearts. So tonight I pray that your, your thoughts and your word for us would benefit each of us individually, give each of us answers to the problems and issues that we're facing right now. Just meet us all where we are at. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, chapter 31 concludes all the chapters about the building of the tabernacle. The tabernacle gave us all the details. We went through all of that. And the biggest emphasis in the tabernacle is how everything in the tabernacle pointed toward Jesus Christ. Whether it's the silver of redemption, the blood of atonement, the gold of deity, the different colors, the different um, fabrics, the structure, um, the, the holy place with the light and the bread, the light of the world and the bread of life. Everything in there points to, to Jesus Christ as the means by which we can approach the Father. So we, we ended up with the incense, the table of incense, uh, through prayer allows us to um, go through the Father <clears throat> and meet with God. The ultimate holy of holies, the place where we meet with God. So chapter 31 wraps that up, and we're going to just start out. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, working gold, silver, and brass, and cutting of stones to set them, carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. So, God has given that instructions for the temple, and he wants to finish it off by saying that there are people in your camp, in your community, that are just as unlearned as the priests. And I'm going to say it that way because God is pointing out that someone may be anointed to be a priest, but someone else might be anointed to be a carpenter or a mason or, you know, dig ditches. And we see here God's plan for his people and also for his body in that everybody has a place. Every joint supplies and everybody in doing what God has called them to do, they are all equally spiritual, equally sacred. And um, in verse 6 says, And also I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahishamach, of the tribe of Dan. And this is a real special verse because it tells us that he is called a number one man, who is Bezalel. And he is also called someone to be a number two man. This is something that doesn't sit well with American um, career seekers. The idea that perhaps my role in life or my job at the time or my calling for the moment is to be a number two person. It's very difficult, but anyone who is a number one person, a leader, a CEO, a pastor, knows the value of having a number two person, a right-hand person, um, someone that is always there to be counted on. And the roughest thing about being a number two person is that more often than not, they want to be a number one person. Uh, orchestra conductors often say the most difficult position to fill an orchestra is the number one second violin. Everyone wants to play first violin. And you need several people to do that. And then people don't want to play second violin. It's the harmony. It's not the show. It's not the big one. But the idea of being the most excellent second violinist is often dismissed because they'd rather be a mediocre first violinist. Because they'd rather have the title and the prestige. So I just think it's a beautiful thought here that God is saying the top craftsman is going to be from the tribe of Judah. And he's going to have an assistant from the tribe of Dan. 
this kind of encapsulates the entire people. And it's just letting everybody know that everybody has their part. Every part is anointed. Every part is given by God. And um, <clears throat> it says they're all wise-hearted. God has put wisdom in them. They may make all that I have commanded thee. So the construction work, the assembly work, the manufacturing, the creating, you know, cutting the jewels, pouring the gold, pouring the silver, um, all the grunt work is equally anointed by God. And I think it's important for those of us that do other things, or whatever God finds us to do, we do with all our might. And we do it to the glory of God. Uh, this is a major problem with America today. People are busy doing good things, but they're not doing, they're not doing good things for the glory of God. It's really idolatrous. It's almost blasphemous. Okay. Oh, he's a good man. Was he doing it for the glory of God? No, he's doing it for his family. That's a good thing, but it's not for the glory of God. That atheist can do good things for his family, but he's not doing it for the glory of God. He's not, also not doing it by the anointing and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it's filthy rags. So one other thing that's fun to point out, I'm not a person that loves dealing, digging into meaning of names. This is kind of not my thing, but I do want to look into, go back to verse 2. Bezalel, Bezalel. It means kind of two things. It means shadow of the Lord or protected by the Lord or the, in the likeness of the Lord. Kind of a shadow is a likeness of the original, the likeness of God, okay? And this person, Bezalel, in the likeness of God, is the son of Uri, which means light. So the likeness of God being the son of light, who is the son of Hur, which is the son of purity, and the tribe of Judah. Now, this actual person has several more generations than the ones listed here. But um, this person, if we put these names together, the shadow of the Lord or hidden by the Lord, protected by the Lord. John 1.18 says, no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son in the bosom of the Father has declared him. So Jesus Christ is being described there in being the bosom of the Father. In John 1.5, it says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness. So Jesus Christ is light, light of the world. Hebrews 4.15 says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like us as we are, yet without sin. So the purity of Christ, the light of Christ, Christ being the likeness of the Father, and Judah meaning just praise, Christ praising God. Um, these are all titles for Christ. So yes, this is a real person. He has a real job here, but I like to try to find Christ wherever I can in the Old Testament. And in this case here, Christ is, verse 3, filled with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and all manner of workmanship. So I think there's a good meditation there for us in that that is who Jesus Christ was. Many prophecies of Christ describe it exactly that way. Wisdom, understanding, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God upon him, and workmanship. Christ is going to be building a church. He's building one right now, but when this is being spoken, the person building, in charge of building the tabernacle, is representing Christ also. So that's just a, a thought that I wanted to throw in there. It's something you can take or leave as you see fit, but I think it's a beautiful thought. So, verse 7, what we now have in verse 7 is, I call it a checklist. And it's a list of things that um, Bezalel and Ahiliab are going to be in charge of doing. So it's a checklist, making sure everything's done properly, decently, and in order. Verse 7, so the end of verse 6, that they may make all that I have commanded thee, therefore now comes the list. The tabernacle of the congregation, the ark of the testimony, which is the ark of the covenant, and the mercy seat that is upon it, 
and all the furniture of the tabernacle, which is the tab table and its furniture, the pure candlestick with all its furniture, the altar of incense, altar of burnt offering with all the furniture and the laver and its foot. That's the bottom of the laver. It's this verse that makes some people think the laver actually had a faucet at the bottom to use to wash feet. Another way to wash feet was to dip into it and pour it on the feet or jump in, which some rabbis think also may have happened. Um, verse 10, and the cloths of service and the holy garments of Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. Again, this includes all the garments as parts of the temple, parts of the tabernacle. These are, these are, I know they're being worn by the priests, but the Bible looks at them as fixtures. These are things that must be done properly and perfectly. If anybody changed or added to or decided to do their own design, if they decided they wanted to make a fashion statement with these garments, they would have in trouble. Cut off from the people, probably struck dead. In verse 11, and the anointing oil and the sweet incense. We talked about that last week because that had very special meaning and special ingredients. Again, you could not change those ingredients. One of the, um, it was Aaron's sons that died because they thought they could come up with a special mixture of their own. Unholy on fire. Or, this is. It says, according, verse, at the end of verse 11, according to all that I have commanded, these shall they do. So that completely wraps up the instructions for the tabernacle. Um, a lot of the laws and functions and um, Levitical activities, much, much more details go along later. But this is enough information to get the thing built and get things started. So we move on to a final section here in the chapter. Verse 12, and the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall also keep. For it is sign between me and you throughout your generation, that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. So, this is important. God has already given the order of Sabbaths several times. He is it's part of one of the Ten Commandments. But it's important here, he's saying, this is the final instruction for building the tabernacle. And what it means is, when you're in the business of building my tabernacle, make sure you keep the Sabbath. In other words, don't be building my tabernacle on the Sabbath. You can do my work, but you remember you keep me first. I think the best way to look at it is this. We must never let the things that we do for God become bigger in our minds than what God has done for us. Let's just let's put that in our minds. We want to make sure we keep what God has done for us is more important in our minds, in our identity and who we are than what we do for God. Remember in Luke 10, when the, the missionaries came back all excited because they were casting out demons and Jesus said, don't rejoice in that. He says, rejoice in that not, that, that the spirits are so subject unto you. Yes, of course demons leave in my name. Yes, of course, you, you know, all the things that you've been given authority to do, you have that authority. But that's not what you rejoice in. Rejoice rather because your names are written in heaven. Our rejoicing, the Spirit of God gives us joy. And our rejoicing comes from the fact that our names are written in the book of life. That is where our strength comes from. And if our strength and motivation or busyness with God's work does not come from that, we burn out. If we get too obsessed with what we're doing for God and don't leave enough room in our hearts for what God has already done for us and what he is doing for us, we, the cart's before the horse. We're going to be very miserable. It's backwards. Um, this phrase he says here is that so that you may know that the Lord sanctifies you. Again, the purpose for the Sabbath was to remind the Jewish people that their sanctification comes from God. Their, um, <clears throat> yes, the atonement does, and uh, their, their name is established, but 
the fact that they maintained fellowship with God. The Sabbath was a reminder for that. It symbolized that. Um, uh, there are really four things that the Sabbath talks about. And one of them is that the, the sanctification, like I just read. Um, keeping the Sabbath was a, an act, a law, a law. It's a legal thing you did. And for those that kept it, it was a symbol that they were sanctified. That they were entering into the rest of God. The rest as in relaxing, um, peace of God. And under the law, the Sabbath was required to do that. The Sabbath was a special sign for the Jewish people, and God gave it to them as being something that was permanent and eternal. Um, for those of us who are in Christ, Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. And in Hebrews, and several, all throughout Hebrews, it talks about the privilege that we in Christ have of entering into that rest based on what Christ did. So we positionally enter into that rest based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And our Christian walk is based on that rest. Once again, we focus on what Christ has done for us, not what we're doing for Christ. Uh, the second thing is the rest of the rest of God. I don't mean the, not the remainder of God, the rest, the peace of God, and how this anticipates the day of the Lord. Because you have seven days of creation, six days of creation, and the seventh day God rested. Uh, you can kind of break human history into six groups of thousands. And we know that the last thousand years of human existence on this planet will be the day of the Lord, the millennial reign of Christ, which also God considers his rest. The Sabbath is part of creation, and creation gives us the explanation for salvation by one man's sin entered in the world. One man's failure. And <clears throat> as a result, by one man, we, we, we can be saved. One man, salvation comes into the world. Onset, evolution releases us from accountability. Evolution removes a point in time where humanity became accountable to God. And so creation goes together with the idea that there is a final reckoning or a final salvation. So, um, so finishing up the um, verse 14. You shall keep the Sabbath therefore for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work therein, your soul should be cut off from among his people. God is saying that this is part of, it's part of the tabernacle. The tabernacle will be respected, and anybody that works in the tabernacle on the Sabbath must die. Because you must rest, you must enter into my rest, and you must remember that I'm the source of your rest. I'm the source of your salvation, your sanctification. Verse 15. Six works may be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Verse 16. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. So this is specifically to Israel. This is for the Jewish people. Verse 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. On the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. That's what I was talking about earlier. This is new revelation. This phrase has never existed before earlier on in the Bible. Whenever God talked about resting on the seventh day, we're talking about God being refreshed. That seventh day, God is refreshed in Christ's rest. God is refreshed in the millennial kingdom. When, when the work of Jesus Christ is fully completed on earth, when the tabernacle resides with human. So verse 18, he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai. When he was done talking with him, he gave him two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So 
God wrote this on the stone, the finger of God. The question that sometimes comes up is what actually was written on this, on these two stones? We typically think of the Ten Commandments because that's what was in the movie. Um, but you can put a lot more than Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. I'm not sure how big they were, but um, they had to be small enough to carry, and small enough to fit into the Ark of the Covenant because these two stones, they eventually, or the second set, end up being going inside the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> Um, Deuteronomy 2 and 3 and 10 all talk about the two stones, and they seem to indicate that it's just the Ten Commandments on there. But when you look at that further, it looks like it means um, everything, including the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Commandments um, is, 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 is specified as being the law. It talks about the law and the covenant. We know that the, the covenant initially for those three chapters after the Ten Commandments, which the nation of Israel confirmed, ratified, had read to them, sprinkled blood on them, the, the moral, um, the civil law that was given there. Um, we also know in the next chapter that both sides were filled up. Some people think that everything that God told Moses during those 40 days, in other words, everything from chapters like 22 on were included on this, which would mean that God's finger is very, very fine font. <clears throat> I'm not sure if the, the rocks could even handle that. Um, that's probably unlikely because God keeps telling Moses, make sure you do everything I show you. So we remember that people in those cultures had much better memories than we did, and they, mem they remember things verbatim. So it's most likely that this contains the civil law and the Ten Commandments. It's possible, there's a lot of things to indicate that the second time around, the Ten Commandments were actually added to what was written. This could be just the civil law, but the ratification of the covenant that was made between the people and God um, at the base of Mount Sinai. It's also important to remember that the people told God, we don't want to hear you anymore. Make sure you get all the information from Moses. So, verse 30, chapter 32. Chapter 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. So, it's almost 40 days, and he's been gone. He's been gone for a long time. People gathered themselves unto Aaron and said unto him, Get up and make us gods which shall go before us. So, the people are reverting back to their old culture. These are people that have spent their entire lives in Egypt, surrounded by gods, and that's what they're comfortable with, and they're used to gods um, visible. They're used to gods that they can look at and appeal to. And so they're getting itchy. It's been 40 days, and they have, don't see Moses anymore, and they're going back to their old ways. So they get up, and they surround Aaron, who's in charge, and they harass and bully him. They say, make us gods. Gods that can go before us. As for this Moses, they are, they're becoming very deprecating about Moses. As for this Moses, that man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't, we don't know what has become of him. So they immediately are going into backslide mode. They stop acknowledging that God brought them out of Egypt. The man who is in charge of them that spoke to God they're dismissing him, and they're going back to what they used to. They're going back to the things they used to know. It's like a drug addict going back to their drugs, a self-righteous person going back to their self-righteousness. This is going back to their old ways, their old lines. <clears throat> um, I thought of the verse in Galatians 3.3, 3, which Paul says, Are you being foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Oh, the God that saved you, the God that saved you from the dominion of Satan, from Egypt, you're going to now try to do the rest of the trip on your own? How crazy is that? Now, Aaron, being the godly leader that he is, said, no way. We just made a promise before God not to make graven images. We're not going to do this. 
I'm, I'm your priest here. I am going to forbid you to do that. Is that what he said? No. And said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, or your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Bring me the gold that you're supposed to be using for the temple. Bring it to me now. People broke off the golden earrings, which are in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. He used man-made implements to carve. This is pretty important because, you know, carving stuff like that with etching tools, it's not pure. And he made a molten calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So he goes ahead and makes the calf. I want you to picture Aaron as being just a, a, a washcloth. I can't think of a good word for it. He's a complete pushover. He's not in full agreement with them, as we'll see later, but he's a complete compromiser. He's a pushover. He doesn't know what to do. He can't stand up for himself. He can't stand up for God. So he does what they ask. He shows it to them, and they make the declaration. This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. They say gods, which means they're now adding this to God. The commandments make no gods before me. I have no other gods before me. In those commandments, God's acknowledging there's other gods out there. But the commandment was, none of them are in front of me. I don't want to see him. You don't put him in front of me. And by including this God among the gods that brought them out, this is abject blasphemy. Remember how the entire country, entire nation declared everything that God says that to do, we will do, right? So when Aaron, this is the key, when Aaron saw the people saying, ah, this is our God, he then builds an altar before it. He builds an altar before that and made a proclamation that says, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Check this out. Aaron, who is a priest of God, the whole, the whole title and office has not been established, but he is the lead priest. They have had priests before. God, Moses has declared certain people to be priests and Aaron and family, Levites. But he's trying to allow the world to merge with God. This is pure compromise, syncretism. This is him saying, Okay, well, I'll let you go ahead and have your golden calf, but let's pretend that we're going to use the golden calf to worship the Lord. This is a church that takes in parts of the world and adopts it. Says so we're going to have this worldly attitude, this worldly value system, and you can fill in whatever you want into this. But we all know churches that say, well, this is a value that the world seems to impose and we're going to accommodate the world, and we're going to still say praise Jesus, although we're worshiping the devil. We're still going to praise Jesus all the while we are profaning God's, God's character and name. And so he says this. He says, tomorrow's the feast of the Lord. It's not true. There's no feast in that month. He's arbitrarily declaring a feast, and he's going to pretend we're going to honor the Lord. This is how Aaron tries to make himself feel okay with this. It's very wicked. So, he declares tomorrow is a feast, verse 6, and they rose up early in the morning. People get up early for things they're excited to do, right? Anybody love getting up early to go to work? So, got early in the morning, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. So they have made offerings, all the things they're supposed to do for God, all the things that the details have been given to Moses on the mountain, they're doing this improperly to an idol. Rose up to play. Sahat, play. This is a very pretty word that literally means drunken, immoral orgies. Okay? So let's not dwell on that too much, but... They have found a God that does not have the restrictions that Yahweh has. And they are going nuts. Verse 7. The Lord said to Moses, now God knows what's going on. God has not ignored the people, although the people are ignoring him. 
The Lord says to Moses, go get thee down for your people, which you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Notice right here, God is setting Moses up. And we need to understand that God is setting Moses up for a test. When God tests us, it is not a test to see how we will perform. God tests us because he already knows how we're going to perform. And the test let us know when we pass the test that we have been approved. God tests us so that when we pass the test, we will be happy. We'll be excited. God's tests are designed to build us up and edify us. Let's keep that in mind as this goes on. Verse 8, they have turned aside quickly. It is pretty quickly. Let's face it, they were just married. Can you imagine? Husband and wife come home from the honeymoon. Husband goes off on a 40-day business trip. And while he's gone, she has an affair. Okay, this is ugly. They, they turn aside quickly out of the way I commanded them and made themselves a, a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are the gods. Israel, which have brought thee up out of Egypt. And God told Moses, I've seen these people, and behold, they're a stiff-necked people. They are stubborn people. So God tells Moses what's going on, and God says, now therefore, let me alone. This is very interesting. Again, God is training Moses. He's setting him up for something. He says, let me alone, so my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Check this out. God says, don't talk to me. Leave me alone. Let me go wipe these people out completely. And when I'm done, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Right now, we talk about Father Abraham had many sons, right? Well, if this had happened, we'd be talking about Father Moses had many sons. God theoretically could have kept his commitment to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob by making sure that he kept his promises to Moses and built a nation from Moses. He could have done that. He tells Moses, leave me alone. I'm going to wipe these people out. And he sits back to see what Moses is going to do. Now, I always like to picture this as God setting up a presentation for the angels. Angels study us. Angels have to go to angel school. So picture this story. God has all the angels watching, watching, and he's getting ready to talk to Moses. He tells the angels, watch this. Watch very, very carefully. Check this out. And he tells this to Moses. He, the angels are watching, and they're going to say, God says, watch what Moses does when I do this. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your anger wax hot against your people? Go back to verse, not, verse 7. God tells Moses, go down at once for your people, which you brought out of Egypt. God disowns them. God says, those are your people, and you brought them out of Egypt. Moses answers back and says, why, the, why does your wrath wax hot against your people, which you brought out of Egypt? He points back to God correctly. He corrects God. Was God wrong? No, God was waiting for Moses to correct. Him. God was waiting for the correct response. It's a test, you know? It's like a scenario. He says, you, what you brought forth out of the land of Israel with great power, with a mighty hand. He says, your mighty hand brought him. Don't put this on me, God. You did it. You've done all the work. And then he reminds him, why should the Egyptians speak and say for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them with the face of the earth? Excuse me, God. If you wipe them out, those Egyptians are going to say, what a wicked, crazy God. He rescued his people to wipe them out. He rescued his people to destroy them. Um, and he's starting to remind God of his promises. He says, please turn away from your fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. That phrase, repent of this evil, is awkward and kind of not appropriate. Repent of this evil implies God's going to do evil. It's not evil. Repent is, please, change your mind. Don't go through with this. And evil in this case means just bad stuff. Please don't do bad things. 
He then says, verse 13, remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Notice he doesn't say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knows better. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the one that has power with God and man. Israel, the one who is redeemed, not the Jacob trickster. He says, your servant, your servants, the ones that you swore by your own self and said, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I swear I will give to your seed is to inherit it forever. So Moses hit him up. Um, let's see. Okay, Moses reminded God of four things. Your ownership. You own these people. You own this mess. Okay? Number two, your grace. He reminds God that you're the God that has given grace in the past and will still do so. He reminds God of his glory. And the way he did it was a reminder of his reputation. You have a reputation. The entire, all these other nations are trembling because we, we did to the Egyptians. Now, are you going to wipe us out and give the Egyptians a bad name? Or give yourself a bad name among the Egyptians? He's hitting that. And he reminds God of his faithfulness. And I want to point out that when we pray, these are things we should remind God of. God always loves to be reminded of his word. Always remember that. And when you pray God's word to him, it has to be in line with his character and nature, right? We're supposed to pray in Jesus' name, right? That means in the character and nature of Jesus. And if we're using Jesus' words and we're using it properly and correctly, that is honoring God's word and God at the same time. It is beautiful. And as a result, verse 14, and the Lord repented of the evil. Again, this is not implying he was going to do evil, but changed his mind. At this point, God looks around to the angels and says, hey, check it out. Did you see what Moses just did? Right. He gave me my words. Who is that coming out of Moses? That's me. And we're going to see a bigger example later at the end of the chapter here. So, at that point, Moses goes down, turned, verse 9, 15, and went down from the mount, and the two tables of testament were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side, on the other, were they written? So this is four sides that are written. That's why it's hard to imagine just the Ten Commandments being on them. <clears throat> Verse 16, and the tab tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables, just in case there was any doubt. Verse 17, when Joshua heard the noise, remember, they all went up. The elders went back down. Joshua and Moses went up a little bit further, and then Joshua stayed behind, and Moses went the rest of the way. Joshua is Moses' servant. On the way back down, he runs into Joshua, and Joshua says, he hears a big noise in the camp. Joshua says, heard the noise of the people as they shouted, and he said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. Joshua heard a big noise, and he's a military man, so he assumes it's war. And he said to Moses, and Moses said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. In other words, not the church choice not the sound of combat or conflict. It is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, it's not the voice of being people being slaughtered. It is the noise of them that sing that I hear. Moses comes down and says, nope, that's not war. That's party. That's partying. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing. Moses' anger waxed hot. I think it's funny. When God tells Moses how angry God is, Moses says, oh, no, 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 no. You need to calm down, God. Don't be so angry. It's your people. You're supposed to be forgiving and loving and that. And Moses comes down, and he sees it for himself now. All of a sudden, things get real. His anger waxes hot. He throws the tablets out of his hand, and they break beneath the mount. Okay. Moses, Moses reminded us several times that God wrote these, and now he smashes them. That's kind of symbolic. People broke the law, so he broke it too. Um, but this is his anger. He's so angry with them. And it, verse 19, and it came to pass as soon as he came nigh up under the camp, he saw the calf dancing, his anger waxed hot. Verse 20, he took the calf that they had made, burned up into the fire, ground it into powder, 
strew it upon the water, and then dumped it into some water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. This is Moses losing his temper. He smashes the golden calf, melts it down, mixes it up, grinds it up into powder, mixes it into water, and says, drink this. This is the uh, Moses version of washing the mouth out with soap. Okay? You want this idol, you can have it. Um, it's interesting. On your own, you can look at Numbers 2319. There is a curse given there for adultery. And, or, or for, it's kind of a test for adultery. And there, um, um, no, I'm sorry, Numbers 5, 18 and 22. Change that, Numbers 5, 18 and 22. It's called the curse of bitter waters. And bitter waters, when given to someone who is accused of adultery, in theory, um, it would cause their, their legs and their bowels to become inflamed and engorged. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's a test or not, but it's, it's there, the idea of drinking one's iniquity. Uh, we, that's just an idea that this is doing here. Um, <clears throat> so, this is Moses' first reaction, verse 21, and then he goes to Aaron. He says, why did this people do to you? What did these people do to you? How could these people have made you do such a horrible thing? You have brought such a great sin on them. And Aaron said, don't let the anger of my Lord burn. He says, no, don't be mad with me, Aaron, Moses. Remember, Aaron is Moses' big brother. Aaron says, don't be mad with me. You know these people. They're set on mischief. These people, you know, they're, they're wicked people. Hey, it's not my fault. He said, this is what happened. They said to me, make us gods. We should go before us. As for Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So the best way to lie, just so you just, uh, make sure is there's as much truth as possible in the lie. You know, that's just, just important information. The best way to lie. And I said to them, well, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So he waters this down. He doesn't beg for all the earrings. He says, well, if you have any extra gold laying around, give it to me. And I put it to the fire, and out came this calf. So this calf that Moses saw and destroyed, Aaron now claims was a miracle. Let's think about this. Something that is designed happens all by itself. This is the message of evolution, of course. Oh, this designed creature, it happened by chance. I just threw it in the fire, and out came a golden cow. I just mixed up stuff. I took all the parts of, a, of an airplane, put it into a tornado, and out came this fully functioning airplane. Moses already knows it's a lie because he tore it apart. He saw it with engraving tools, right? It was engraved. It was carved out. Even if it did pop out of a fire, it wouldn't have engraving marks on it. It had the marks of humanity on it. <clears throat> and then most of the people were naked. For Aaron had made them naked into the shame among their enemies. So this is pointing out that if anybody who is not Jewish, there were nomads living in the land. We know there are other people of Abimelech. There were, you know, if anybody in the surrounding hills had happened to look down and see the people of God doing this, it would have been embarrassing to their enemies. And this is saying that Aaron was fully complicit in their nakedness. Nakedness always refers to sin and being uncovered, but it's literal in this case. And so Moses, verse 26, stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. All the sons of Levi gathered themselves unto him. Levites, the kid, the, the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Simeon were given a special curse that they would always be divided and scattered. At this point, the Levites, um, they redeem that curse. They still will eventually become scattered, but now they're going to be scattered among the tribes as representatives of God. This is where their redemption comes. Moses was also the tribe of Levi that may have had something to do with it. But let him come and... Verse 27, he said unto them, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and going out from the gate, the gate throughout the camp, so every man his brother and every man his companion, every man his neighbor, 
and their children. Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day 3,000. I know I'm going fast, but the idea is here, if you take this literally, go out and kill everybody. It must have been clear, implicit from Moses to go and take out the ringleaders, go out and take out the people that were actively supporting this. And so at the end, there's 3,000 people dead. So this is the punishment that Moses puts on them because of his anger. Um, you could make a case that that's worse punishment than what God might have done because God promised to, to um, not wipe everybody out. Okay? <clears throat> so verse 29, Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Every man upon his son and his brother, he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. For eventually I shall make atonement for your sin. This is very important. Moses says, I'm going back to the Lord. And hopefully I'm going to find some way to atone for your sin. This is different. He's not, asking, he's not saying I'm going to go up and ask for God's mercy. He wants to find a way to atone for his sin. We know that Moses cannot atone for their sin. Only a perfect man can atone for their sin. But Moses is beginning to pick up the identity of Christ in the sense that he's picking up on the characteristics of Christ. He has already demonstrated being Christ-like by begging the Father to forgive. He is now going to go up to the Father and try to find some way to atone. And in atoning, He's demonstrating the character and nature of Jesus Christ. So, verse 31, Moses returned unto the Lord and said, These people have sinned a great sin, and they made them gods of gold. This god of gold is a calf. This calf is an Egyptian god. Um, and calf worship is prevalent throughout the entire ancient world. All throughout, everywhere you go, there's calf worship. There is still calf worship or cow worship in India today. Something about cows turned the ancient world into worshiping them. Something about their being totally contented, you couldn't upset them. I guess it's nice to have a God you can't make man. So, a God that you can't be accountable to. But it's, it's amazing, it was calf worship that later on... Um, uh, Jeroboam, in 1 Kings 12, Jeroboam, when he stood up and set up the northern kingdom, he took counsel and made calves of gold at the north and the south and said, these are the gods that brought you up out of Egypt. It, it stayed there throughout your history up until the return under Ezra. That is when idolatry finally ceased. But it was part of their, it kept showing up in the back of their minds throughout that. So, verse 32. Moses says, yet now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Moses offers to have God wipe his name out of the book of life, if he will save the people. And he, at this point, basically says, um, God, send me to hell, but save those people. And of course, Moses is not qualified to atone for the sins of the people. But he is demonstrating the character of Jesus Christ. We know that Paul did the same thing. He said, I'd be willing to go to hell if my Jewish brother could all be saved. At this point, God points to the angels and says, check it out. That's me coming out of Moses. This is me coming out of Paul. When you and I laid on our lives for Christ, when we laid on our lives and demonstrate um, a sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. We do things for the sake of God and the kingdom. God points to the angel and says, hey, look who's coming out of that person. God is excited when Jesus Christ comes out of us. When he sees Jesus' character and nature come out of us, the angels applaud. And so these times that God does this to people in their tests, when God does the test to Job, when Job finally says, I thought I knew you, but now I've seen you with my eyes. I now understand who you are. 
I now can fellowship with you in a brand new way. The entire angelic realm and the demonic realm are put back on their heels. Satan is not back on his heels because Jesus Christ is coming through one of his creations. And this is, this is the real message of this for us today. So, he's willing to have his name blotted out, blotted out of the book of life. Verse 34, therefore now go, lead the people under the place of which I have spoken unto thee. I'm sorry, I'm, I skipped the verse. Verse 31 said, and the Lord says to Moses, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. In other words, I can't take your deal. Someone that sins, they're out of my book. But go down, lead the people into the place in which I have spoken thee, and behold, my angel, this is the same angel we promised earlier, this is Jesus, will go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because of they had made the calf, which Aaron made. So, we'll, we'll stop right there, but I just want you to realize that God is excited. Moses has come to a point where he's willing to sacrifice himself. However, he cannot take up Moses' offer because no human being can pay for the sins of another because they have their own sins to pay for. There is coming to Moses, there is someone coming who's going to be able to do that. When the Messiah comes, he will make the atonement, and everything that you learned about me in the tabernacle will come to pass someday. However, God had promised them that if they followed his laws, none of these diseases would come upon them. So the last verse there is God plagued the people. We do not know the nature of this plague. There's no details given in the Bible. But the good news is, is God did not wipe them all out. God had already promised not to do that when Moses left the first time. The exciting thing is that Moses has become more Christ-like. And his and. There's going to be some more give and take later on because, just not to spoil it, but at some point, Mo God tells Moses, I'm not going with you. I'm not leading. You're on your own. And Moses once again says, no, if you don't go with me, I don't go. And I think it's a beautiful thing. Israel means power with God and men. And as Christians, we have a God that's entreatable. We have a God that is constantly training us. We have a God that interacts with us. We don't have a God that just simply says, submit, obey, behave, shut up, and do it. Okay? There's other gods like that. You know, there's other gods, other religions where your only job is to submit and shut up and, and just do what you're told. There's no fellowship there. God is, God is more, more interested in fellowship than he is just blind submission. Obedience is absolutely important. It's more important than sacrifice. But fellowship and god causes fellowship by allowing us to get into situations that cause us to pray and we pray and we call out and we we do some wheeling and dealing sometimes and we do some interacting we um <clears throat> you know that's who we are but we should never feel guilty about that because first of all guilt's taken care of by the cross and secondly god is, is more interested in developing us our number one goal as Christians is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And that confirmation is who we are in Christ. And God takes account of our personality, our situation, our position, everything we do. So, yeah, we'll see you, Stuart and Edith. Thanks so much. But the beauty of the gospel is ultimately that fellowship. So we'll dig more into this in the subsequent chapters. I don't want to end on a downer there, the plagues, but this interaction, this picture we should always have of God showing us off to the angels. It's very real. We are trophies of grace, and God loves to show up his trophy case. And if he can develop our character, develop our dependence on him, develop our, um, our faith, and develop our understanding of his love, while at the same time showing us off and making demonstrations of the cloud of witnesses that we're always in front of, that's so much the better. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this exciting portion. 
Thank you for the love you have demonstrated for us that you would go through all this just to share your heart and your thoughts with us. Thank you for your redemption. Thank you that um, if it were not for you, if it were not for your grace and mercy, we would all be consumed. Yes. So just pray that you'd bless everybody here. We just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 It was beautiful as usual. Good to see you, Janice. Thank you. Good to see you. You know, it's so sweet when we can just come before God and ask him to increase while we decrease. Wow. And, wow. and how, you know, when we just put that on the altar, it's just amazing what he does as he shines through us, like you said. Wow. So thank you for that word. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> hey, girlfriend. How you doing, Sam? <laughs> well, everybody have a blessed week. Okay. God bless. Hey, Harry. How you, you need to put your mic on if you want to say something. Harry, you need to put your mic on. Is that good? Hello? Hey, how are you doing, Harry? Good. You can hear, hear me now? Yep, we're fine. Okay. Praise God for class tonight, Pastor. I had a question, maybe mixed with a comment, but um, I saw Jan on TV on a commercial, too. Tell her congratulations if she's still there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Utterly amazing about uh, the whole night about how God does everything and we you know, need to realize that, especially understanding his love. I wanted to go back to the point of the angels and how Moses said back to him his own word. Remember that part? Yes, yeah. Of the class. And I was just mesmerized by the thought of it. I visualized, like, God said to Moses, and Moses said back to God two things. It was like proving God's uh, character like when he was asking that, say that again exactly how he uh, asked it. Um, I like the idea of where Moses reminds God that he's merciful, reminds God of his reputation or his glory, uh, reminds yeah. him that he's a forgiving God, and reminds him that he's a faithful God, reminds him of his promises. So yeah. all those things are, he's giving God's word back to him. And then later yeah. on, he offers himself as a sacrifice. And yes, and it was all because of God's question, right? That he gave his yeah. word back to him. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, 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 I'm making stuff up here, but I like the idea of God looking at the angels and saying, hey, check this out. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah. So I, I thought how ingenious it is of God to have Mo cause Moses to say God's own word back to him. Because in that way, Moses is actually learning the word in, in unbeknownst to him in an enforced way, or how would say, uh, inadvertently. It's getting into Moses. It's because God. Part of him, exactly. Yeah, and I was just so mesmerized by that fact. And then, plus, it's like God says, What? Prove me now here with, says the Lord. What happened? Did I reconnect? Okay. okay. I think we reconnect or something. What point did you last hear? Improve me. Improve, improve me now. Here's what says the Lord. Yeah, so it's like a dual thing. Moses is actually stating how God is true, you know, and God always says, prove me now. So God can never be proven wrong, right? So, so that's strengthening Moses as he's saying God's own word. I don't know, it's just like a little rhema to me. It was like a double whammy <laughs> in God's ingenious way of loving us by causing us to say his, his word. I, I'm a little, some, I seem a little scattered, but it's, it's just a rhema. No. And th thanks for the whole night. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's um, special in our own lives. We start to realize sometimes that maybe something bad can happen and it drives us to our knees. 
And um, I, I came up with a saying several years ago that anything that drives us to our knees, anything that drives us to our knees by definition is a good thing. I just lose myself again. <laughs> Oh, come on. Some kind of hard, yeah. Sorry about that. What's your happen? Oh, to take over with you guys. Yeah. Harry's happy, whatever you want to say. Yeah. Okay. See you, Nords. Take care. Um, I just wanted to say the one phrase that I came up with a while back, anything that drives us to our knees, by definition, makes it a good thing. Amen. Yes. Thoughts there. Amen. Any little thoughts there? Hey, Gay, how are you doing tonight? Yeah, you're still muted also, gang. Well, you have your little brother uh, joining us here at the last again. He's over here in the corner. Oh, cool. Hey. Hey, This kind of neighbor come in that thinks it's morning instead of nighttime. He gets the sunsets and sunrises and sunsets confused. Come now. You want to watch the Olympics? No, my TV's all grainy. I'm blind. You do it. 15. Okay, sure. You can have another. I will. It's a little soft. Maybe we'll next time take it. It's so amazing. I need to do that more than. Okay, okay, Harry. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Jermaine, one more time. You want? I mean, Gay, you want to say something else there? No, it's just a little hard to concentrate. Forgive me. Oh, no problem at all. Just, just glad you're here. So, well, any other last thoughts, or we can wrap it up with a final prayer. Uh, what was that? What was that numbers uh, reference that you gave? Which one? Um. <laughs> Where did I write it in here? For the bitter waters? Yeah. Uh, numbers 5, 18 to 22. Numbers 5, 18. Look at my cute visitor. Oh, wow. Hi, visitor. Looks like a little Ewok. <laughs> so cute. Yeah, loves to kiss me. There you go. That's nice. Yeah, the other numbers when I started to mention... Numbers 23:19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. So the idea that God changes his mind is really nonsense because he knows the end from the beginning. But bothers people sometimes that the Bible often presents God in an anthropomorphic way. The idea with, with, with human qualities, the idea of being able to have his mind changed. God never changed his mind. He never was going to wipe out anybody. You know, that, that was never the issue. The issue was Moses and, and the instruction that he was trying to teach Moses. That's one thing I had not thought of. You know, they talk about Moses changed God's mind. When he said, you know, change your mind, don't wipe out these people. It was Moses' prayer that changed God's mind is what I've always heard. <laughs> and you said that God never planned on wiping him out. He was testing Moses. Well, it's, it's hard to, you know, our, our brains have a hard time with this whole foreknowledge, free will stuff. But God knew that Moses was going to say that, so he was ready for it. I mean, you can go that way, too. I just, an omniscient God has no need to change his mind because he knows the end from the beginning. But he right. God that has chosen to create, create free will creatures and he has voluntarily chosen to interact with them on that basis. Again, Israel means power with God and man. So power with God means that he's entreatable. 
we can come before him. He does listen to us. He does respond to us. And he can make changes. You know, the Lord's Prayer, my will on earth as it is in heaven, is God's, it, we say, things on earth aren't great, God. I need you to change something here on the earth. We need, we need the earth to be to line up with your perfect will. And he the, King James, the King James Version says in earth, not on earth. The newer ever translations have made it on earth. In the my earth, mother, my it, mother always said, God wants to make his will known within earth. That's within you because you are made of earth. That, that's not, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, in the earth. Revelation talks about um, the inhabitants of the earth. And then that's a special category of those that are not citizens of heaven. So, but yeah, in the earth, I like that. That's very nice. And in the, we're all, we're in earth. all we have, he has possibility of making his will known within each one of us. Sure. Yeah. We're all, and if it's not throughout the whole, we're all, all part of play. That's, that's good. I like that. So Pastor John. Yes, sir. Yes, I was thinking of the forbearance of God that Paul speaks about in the New Testament. Yeah. And uh, that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. Yeah. So uh, uh, this time with Moses, God could see Christ slain before the foundation of the world. And uh, Moses was kind of like the man in uh, Ezekiel who God needed a man to stand in the gap. then. And Moses is standing in the gap now, and because of the forbearance and Christ who was slain before the foundation of the world, it's a wonderful plan that God has had. Yeah, those are all types of Christ that give us different ways to understand and look at him. But you you probably know one of my foundational verses is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Okay. That's the only reason God could talk to Adam after he fell. Ah. Right. Wow. You imagine Adam wow. sins. He's fallen. Game over. Right. That's it. You know, wow. When Christ comes to see that when visit him in the garden, he's not there. Right. Well, that's the end of the Bible. That's the end of human race. Right. It's done. Um, I like that. Well, that's it. But somehow God manages to look past the sin. He can't fellowship with sin. I mean, it really is, like I said, game over. That's the end of human history. Everybody born after that is going to hell. Everybody's going to kill each other off eventually, and it's, just, it's complete ruination. Some, because the land was there before the foundation of the world, right. Jesus is able to say, where are you? Okay. He called Thank you. He's able to talk to the fallen Adam. He's able to not fellowship with sin, not interact right. with sin, but fellowship with his own atonement, which is yet to happen in the future, and say, because I was slain for the foundation of the world, I can now commune with Adam and set up a system whereby he can be saved. Thank you. That's a great praise. Dad God has that. something. <laughs> yeah. John? Yes, ma'am. Mom. Ma'am. Mom. Oh, yes. uh, Dad was wanting to talk, and he's kind of away from the computer here. Yeah. That goes along with something I run across, too, that we cannot disappoint God. Right. People say, well, you're going to disappoint God. You let him down. You can't disappoint him because he already knows yeah. <laughs> from the beginning. And he also knows that we cleave to the dust. And by that same, by that same rationale, you can't surprise him either. You can't shock him. You can't horrify him. You can't say, oh, I didn't see that one coming. Yeah, oops. <laughs> Yeah. Um, or it's, it's equally incorrect to say, oh, I had such a perfect plan and Adam screwed it up. Well, let's go to plan B. This is all timelines. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that sounds good. So, um, well, well, Dad, you want to close with a prayer? Heavenly Father, it's been good again to get some of these details and uh, how, and see how John can work out some of these things that we don't always see everything, but we know that you are there and we are thankful for this study and for the uh, depth that we can get from this. 
and how we get to see you in every part of scripture and get to know you better and help us to remember that some of these things that you're learning. Bless us now to and help you, help bless you. My name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank See you, you today, you and your new well. friend. Janine, hi, bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, everybody, take care. Love you all. Thanks so much. Okay. Love to you, too. Okay, see you, Janine. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.